Hello, friends. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Kaderna podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. So this week's episode was one of the most intriguing interviews I've done yet on the show, and I don't say that lightly. Our guest today is Jim Campbell. For those of you who do not know Jim, he's the host of the nationally syndicated radio show, Business Talk with Jim Campbell, and a crime show, Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. He's known for hard-hitting interviews on some of the biggest stories in business, sports, and politics. He's particularly known for having the first interview with former Governor Elliot Spitzer after his resignation, the first interview with Tyco CEO Dennis Kozlowski after his release from prison, and the first extensive interview with Rumi Khan, a government informant in one of the biggest insider trading busts in American history. However, Jim's latest first is one that trumps them all. So Jim recently released his new book, Madoff Talks, subtitle Uncovering the Untold Story Behind the Most Notorious Ponzi Scheme in History. It's now available wherever books are sold. So Jim was granted over several years exclusive access to Bernie Madoff while he was still living in prison, and they shared over 400 pages of letters and emails together. He also had access to Bernie's widow, Ruth Madoff, his sons, and Bernie's personal attorney, Ira Sorkin. So this book tells the story, the why and the how, of how Bernie Madoff orchestrated a $65 billion scam. Like I said, the biggest in history. So join me as we dive right into it and really get into the nitty gritty details and truly untold story and unfettered access to the family and to the man himself behind this evil empire. Without further ado, Jim Campbell. Is going to require work and time and sweat and toil. If money wasn't an issue, what would I be doing? Don't worry about it. You'll figure it out. Change is the only constant. The Kadena Podcast. Thank you for having me, Brian. It's my honor, and uh, we're very excited about Madoff Talks, uncovering the untold story behind the most notorious Ponzi scheme in history. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I saw the title of the book, and I was like, "Man, this ought to be an entertaining read." <laughs> how how long was that a work in progress that you were uh, putting um, that together for? Believe it or not, in December of two thousand and eleven, I got to speak with Andy Andrew Madoff, who by then obviously was uh, not only vilified but not talking to any media. I got to talk to him off the record, and um, uh, he was. I found him very open to taking brutally tough questions from me. So we developed kind of a rapport. I was doing a live show then, and he um, said that he was actually going to listen to see if he, I was saying the same things I was saying to him. And in return for that, I had the coincidence of, um, and this is also in December, uh, his mother had to be moving from Florida to old Greenwich, Connecticut, where I live. And I had lunch with her, and um, that led to her introducing me to Bernie. So actually the story... Uh, I started talking to them in 2011, and the book came out in April of 2021, uh, about a month ago. Okay, great. So that was quite a work in progress. And how did you get into that? Was that just because of the the work you're doing now, interviewing and writing books and so on? Or did you have any history uh, with those circles? Yeah, no, it was literally, I was interviewing for my business talk show, Lori Sandell, who wrote a book on the Madoff family that they cooperated with, Andrew and his, and his girlfriend, Catherine Hooper. And um, so I had, it was purely fortuitous. And she said, you know, for your prep, I'll hook you up with Andy off the record. And that's how it happened. And, um, and the same thing with Ruth after she, you know, after, you know she trusted Andrew, obviously. And uh, we also hit it off. Although when we walked out of the restaurant in Old Greenwich, I said, can we get a picture? And she turned to me and she said, you're wired, aren't you? She thought I'd set her up. But after she was calmed down about that, um, Bernie said to me that, you know, Andrew and Ruth have vouched for you. So I'm going to talk to you and hopefully you can dispel some of the perceptions of the misperceptions that are out there. And of course, it didn't exactly work out once I finished the way he had anticipated. But I think he had kind of hoped that I would be sort of conned if you will, into representing his side of the story, um, as well as uh, the families. And so that's how it happened. I mean, both of those were coincidences that I got to talk to Andy and that Ruth happened to be moving 
Joel Greenwich. Ruth and I then had a series of lunches over several years. We texted a lot. Uh, we emailed a lot. Um, so, you know, we got to know each other uh, quite well. When McGraw-Hill gave me the contract, and she had supported the book, she'd helped ke keep it going when the warden was blocking mm -hmm. Bernie and I, um, she said that she no longer wanted to talk. So I had what I had from her, but she didn't want to talk once the book contract was signed. I think related to the fact they were trying to get Bernie out on compassionate release um, to, so he could spend the last months of his life. And so they didn't really want any publicity. She also asked Bernie to stop talking. Gotcha. This is Ruth Madoff, the, the widow of Bernie Madoff, giving you all this information. And so that's, I mean, that's unique. That was going to be my question is everybody knows who Bernie Madoff is, one of the most notorious crimes probably in, in the history of, of mankind, at least from a financial standpoint. Um, and that's why I was going to say, why would they want to talk to just one more media source? And, mm -hmm. and that was that they thought that they might have a chance to get some public opinion on their side with all of this. Well, um, when, when you say they, Andrew and Ruth were clearly in the camp that Bernie was guilty and that there were no excuses for it. They were, of course, interested in clearing their name because everybody, even including the FBI, who I talked to several later, were convinced that they knew or had to know. So, I mean, that was their take. Bernie's, I think, Bernie, if you understand his ego, um, he had to be the guy, had to be the guy in control. He, he ran, and a lot of people don't know this, um, one of the most successful market-making firms on Wall Street that basically broke down the doors of the New York Stock Exchange and um, was number three in volume and was worth $3 billion in and of itself. He ran it completely clean, ethics above the norm on Wall Street. And so he was just obsessed with protecting the name of that firm, uh, that it was legitimate. And then in his hedge fund business, which he'd hidden for so long and where the Ponzi scheme was, he was obsessed with telling me that the strategy really did work. It wasn't fake. It wasn't, you know, um, managed in, in a way that, you know, he created results out of the air, et cetera, et cetera. Even when he'd go through a whole logical explanation and say, now, Jim, I realize I wasn't doing any real trading. In other words, almost delusionally wanting... Wow to justify and rationalize everything he did. That's incredible. But I guess when you get in so deep, you kind of, your mind starts playing tricks on you, maybe. But um, when did you first hear about Bernie Madoff? Can you remember even before you were introduced or had contact with him? Well, uh, you mean about the Ponzi scheme? You know, this was 2011. No, no, no. And the Going back even further, like you mentioned at the outset, that there was a time where he ran a legitimate business and a clean business. Yes. Um, you know, was were you aware of him on the street at all that he was? Yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good question. No, I was not. And you know, he had a very high regard amongst the regulators, which of course was a perfect setup for pulling this off. But he was an inside kind of guy. Um, he always kept his hedge fund obviously completely under the table, and his business. You know, he, he would tell me, you know, he was the guy that executed for discount brokers back when nobody on Wall Street obviously wanted to touch them, but they were a very lucrative uh, form of business. And he did touch them and he loved dealing with them. He hated the hedge fund clients for obvious reasons, but um, I did not know of him then. So this was, um, you know, surprised me. And, you know, the book has, you know, the untold components, um, which it's stunning how little people know of the whole story, even though they think they do. But the thing on Bernie, of course, was the people not knowing that he ran such a big legitimate business worth three billion bucks at the same time. He ran the biggest criminal enterprise. The other side of that, which we can talk as we go on, is the complete systemic failure on the regulatory and Wall Street sides that basically allowed him to do this for 40 years because he was not a guy acting alone behind a curtain. He was a guy, the only guy that knew was a Ponzi scheme, but he couldn't have gotten away with it for so long without being enabled um, by a whole series of different uh, entities and people. Wow. And if, if you can maybe even just, and I'm, I'm glad we're starting here with, with your brand new book, because this is, it's such an exciting topic that I think people can't get enough of. And we'll learn more about some of your other work as we go here. 
but sticking with Madoff, what was mm -hmm. what was really the genesis uh, that you found from your interviews and such of this whole criminal empire? Like, how did it begin? Is there something that you can go, point back to as like the very onset of uh, what was this Ponzi scheme? Yeah, it's a good question too because um, I even I started off with it's logical to assume oh you're running a very legitimate business and so something must have happened that you lost some money or something and you decided instead of doing the right thing to double down like a gambler might do and you know you try to make it back um, however you can and then you get it back and no one will ever notice and everything looks like it's fine he actually told me that story um, one that he hadn't told anybody else publicly and one he hadn't even told uh, his lawyer who he told a different story to and Bernie uh, for some reason waived attorney client privilege so I could talk to his lawyer who was like like sort and very noted guy but here's the thing Bernie represented to me that the Ponzi scheme didn't start along with this story one day before 1992 and at that point he admitted you know Jim I got into this thing and you know became a Ponzi scheme and on and on and on he would admit the Ponzi scheme now, I had to go vet everything he said after he said it, and lo and behold, and this is the most unfathomable part of his mind. He had a very compartmentalized mind, which you have to do to run two businesses at once. But he would, looks to have actually started running the criminal side of his business, which was on the 17th floor of the lipstick building behind Lock Key. Um, that even his sons who ran the market making business did not have access to. The legitimate business was two floors above on the 19th floor. And so what happened was he was actually running them side by side, basically since the start, which was the late 60s, early 70s. So he's got a legitimate business and his brain is managing a criminal business side by side. And that, that's the part that's really um, the most uh, confusing to deal with. Now, what kind of psychological mindset did he have that might have been underlying this? And as I looked into it, the market making business fit his psyche really well in his psychology. It was whether the market was up or the market was down, he made money on commissions. He was very innovative on use of technology, leading the street in many ways. And he hired good people. And he kept great cost control. So it's a great formula for that business to be successful. Now he goes over, he starts with only 24 accounts, mainly family and friends. And he's going to manage some money for these folks. And he, and he finds out, oh, my God, I don't make money on every trade. I could lose money. He psychologically could not accept losses at all. In fact, his clients came to realize, hey, you don't lose money with Bernie. I don't know what he's doing, but you don't lose any money. He initially lost some money in an IPO when he was first starting off, and uh, the underwriters didn't stabilize the price. They ran away, and he was facing a $30,000 loss, or his customers were, and he was mortified. He went and borrowed $30,000 from Ruth's uh, father and paid his clients back, made them whole, even though none of his clients would have expected that, nor did they, have, nor did they need it. So in other words... The business that didn't fit his psyche, rather than close it down or accept that it didn't work, he had to keep pleasing people, and he grew it, and he grew it, and he grew it. And the next thing he knew, $65 billion or what people thought they had. Wow. And when was that, that first incident, like with the IPO that you mentioned, where things went south, and he said, you know, I'm going to have to bail out my customers here? Just roughly what time frame was that? Uh, they, the IPO loss was in 1962. And that was wow. fairly soon after he um, opened the, uh, the overall business, right, where he began to make his name in, in market making. So in other words, he was actually managing money from pretty much the start of the firm. Um, and then it got bigger several years later uh, when he was essentially an accounting firm that used to be run by his father, uh, father-in-law, Ruth's father again. Um, actually became sort of a feeder fund, the model for how he got money. And that's when uh, it exponentially, exponentially grew. Got it. And if I could just take a step back, you explain market making. Can you just kind of define what exactly that is for our listeners? Yes. Um, 
what the market maker does is put together uh, trades, in this case, for um, customers, uh, discount brokers mainly, but including Merrill Lynch, uh, for instance, firms like that. He was acting as a wholesaler. And obviously Merrill and uh, Schwab uh, and firms like that are retail. And what he did was take the execution over for them, which uh, offloaded it from them and gave him all the regulatory requirements. And he built all the connections to the various exchanges. And he beat the exchange in pricing, uh, better pricing. And he ended up doing it so quickly that um, Schwab could advertise, we can execute your trade right while you're on the phone. And um, that, that's how he got it done. He got very close then to all of those customers and he treated them really well. He even designed his systems um, to make sure that his customers got the best price. In fact, what Wall Street thought Bernie was doing that, that allowed him to never have any losses was to front run his clients. Now that means jumping right ahead of orders that you know are coming. So if Brian's gonna buy a hundred shares of IBM, he, that's a bullish sign. And in some little way, it'll, it'll increase the market. And then the assumption was he would jump right in before and buy IBM knowing it was going to go up right behind him. And that's what they thought he was doing. And he built a system uh, that wouldn't allow that to happen. He never screwed his clients, but it, it kept the regulators and Wall Street chasing the wrong rabbit all the time. Interesting. And so when does he transition from doing a lot of this market making in the 60s to eventually managing people's money? Uh, when did that occur where he started going out and getting the rich and the famous and all of these folks that eventually yes. we heard about on the news that were actually individual clients of Bernie Madoff? Yeah, that was built really uh, over the 70s to the 90s. In the 90s, um, it started to become um, you know, more public um, and you know, he basically admitting, um, although he always tried to cover up. He, what he basically tried to say was, you know, we don't manage money. We execute trades, um, which is what he did in his regular business. And that allowed him to say that I was only making commissions. And what did he do? He started getting all this money that you're talking about from hedge funds that were feeder funds. And these are hedge funds of hedge funds, essentially, who allocate their investors money based on their, um, uh, you know, their risk, their risk uh, curves and what they're looking for in their investment objectives. And what he did essentially was to buy these guys not doing any due diligence, was to pass on his asset management um, uh, fees that come that hedge fund guys take, which is normally 2% of fees under management and 20% of gains. That's an incredible amount of money to pass to essentially what were marketing vehicles, funneling money to different hedge funds. And that's how he started accumulating big assets along with his uh, individual long-time customers. And um, the interesting uh, thing was, Bernie will tell you, and he, as he told me, he didn't really go out and solicit clients. He had this all fed in through networks, the feeder funds, um, family and friends. And it just came to him in what was essentially affinity crime, meaning 85%, in his case, 85% of his clients um, were Jewish and a lot of Jewish charities as well, all of whom he wiped out. And um, that's basically what happened was, hey, this guy's the Jewish T-bill, as they call him. He's as safe as the U.S. Treasury. Um, we don't know how he do, he's doing it, but it works. He's trustworthy. He's our guy. And just give him your money. You'll get your 11% a year, which is what he got uh, at the end. And what a lot of people don't realize is that, you know, you think running a Ponzi scheme, the, buy, the guy behind the curtains making all the money. Actually, Bernie had what he called to me his big four. And these were four longtime original investors who bailed him out when he had periodic cash crises. And they came to have power to extort their returns from him, the biggest of whom took out $7 billion dollars out of that hedge fund that Bernie was running under the table. Bernie himself only stole 800 million that he used to prop up the upstairs legitimate business when it started to uh, have problems uh, with insolvency. So actually Bernie wasn't even the biggest moneymaker. He didn't do it for greed. 
um, but his big four uh, did. And they would literally have the power to call up Bernie or his right-hand administrative assistant, Annette Bongiorno, and say, I want 40% gains X, Y, and Z, and then call back a few months later and say, I want these losses um, for tax purposes and dictate those. So wow. he, got the, uh, he got the clients over time from the feeder funds, family and friends, the affinity network, and he, uh, uh, some of his uh, family and friends like the big four took advantage of the whole deal, made up, made most of the money. And who, who are these big four? Is that public knowledge now? Yes. Um, Jeffrey Pickhauer is the guy to know. He's the biggest guy that I told you about. Uh, the yeah. second was Norm Levy, who was actually very close to Bernie. Bernie came to detest Pickhauer. Um, as you could understand, Pickhauer had him, um, you know, in a position where uh, he could extort, uh, Norm Levy was one was a father figure to him, although Bernie ended up ripping him off. Um, the third guy was Carl Shapiro, who was a huge guy in the garment district and sold his business for a ton of money. And the fourth guy was Stanley Chase. He grew up in the Bronx, but he was out in uh, Hollywood where his wife was in script writing or something. And he had he made a lot of money. And <laughs> Bernie turned him into a feeder fund guy. So he in turn fed folks through his own fund to Bernie. And I always laugh at this. Stanley would had no conception of what Bernie's strategy was, which was called the split strike conversion strategy. He had no idea what it was. He didn't want to know what it was, even though he was funneling clients to it. But he had one stricture. I don't want to ever have any losses. So those are those are the big four. The other three, they took out a billion or two, you know, and um, Pickhauer took out seven billion. So, you know, they made about 10 billion bucks collectively. Um, the losses on a principal original investment basis were 19.5 billion. Wow. And so these these folks, the big four, the other, you know, really big players in all of this, is there any inkling that they knew uh, what was going on here? You know, did they, yeah. ha did they hold that over Bernie and any way like hey we're kind of in we know what the deal is here yeah i think they did not know that it was a pure ponzi scheme because obviously they wouldn't have left their money there although i did notice at the end they were pretty close to having their money out but they obviously knew that he had periodic cash crises that he was allowing them to back tra day trades remember bernie wasn't really trading so all the trades were made up and these guys knew they were backdating trades which is not kosher and um, so that's how they came to have the power over him. Bernie, of course, knew that they were doing all kinds of tax fraud, which the government, by the way, never even investigated or held them accountable for. Nobody went to jail. And so they had to know uh, that something was wrong. They didn't know it was a Ponzi scheme. Now, let's go to the feeder fund guys, because Bernie is basically bribing them with all these asset management fees and not allowing in response any due diligence. Well, remember, their whole job is due diligence, right? They're, Brian's a very conservative investor. They're going to look around these hedge funds and they'll say, Brian, my due diligence says this fund A is the one for you. Well, Bernie wasn't allowing that. So obviously they knew something wasn't right there. And they were what I call willfully blind, which is a criminal offense but they were not charged with will for blindness. They were gone after for clawbacks uh, of money, uh, et cetera. But um, the funds, so, and, there were, and, then, and then I'll say the third group, there were folks on Wall Street that knew that something was wrong. I told you they thought it was front running, but th there were folks on Wall Street that knew it didn't smell right and did not take any action such as turning them in uh, to the SEC. And we haven't even gotten to how the SEC screwed up. <laughs> and maybe that's kind of a good segue there. I think everybody's question, when you just look at average America and they see this guy talking about, you know, what was it, $65 billion, I believe he said, the size of this whole thing. And they say, how does this happen? You know, how does a guy get to that power kind of unchecked? Uh, what I wanted to ask to kind of lead into this is, was there something pre-2008 where it could have sparked an investigation or it could have sparked some questions that perhaps went ignored. Because lots of times in, in these criminal uh, incidents, you hear about 
something was brought up and then it was, you know, well, that guy is held in good regard. Let's, why don't we just sweep that under the carpet for right now? Did anything like that ever go on? Any kind of whispers of that? Yeah, that, by the way, turns into a great segue to the SEC because the SEC okay. actually did five separate examinations of Bernie and never uncovered it. And they cleared him of front running but each investigation that came along, they reinvestigated front running. They did not have the right examiners on site to detect the Ponzi scheme, which is relatively easy. Um, and we'll get into the details, but let me tell you from an overall point of view, there were actually several ways that you could have solved this in under five minutes. Um, <laughs> the first one is the split strike conversion strategy, which sounds very complex, opaque, and that's how he wanted it on a simplified basis, was a equity strategy that mirrored the market, uh, basically using S&P um, index, uh, 100 index and options. And it should therefore have been highly correlated to the market. So even before you check whether it was or not, when, you, when it's represented as never taking a loss, right off the bat, there's never been an equity-based strategy that doesn't face market loss. It doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. Um, and then of course the whistleblowers, uh, you know, Harry Markopoulos, I'm sure, he determined within a couple of hours, the correlation was 5%, meaning the degree to which it matched the market, it should have been 95%. The second example of five minutes or less, um, one of the SEC examinations, um, Bernie, and Bernie told me this, um, Repository Trust Clearing Corporation clears and settles all the trades. In his market-making business, every single market-making trade could be traced going through there. His account number, as Bernie said, was 0646. He told the SEC that he had a sub-account for his investment advisory business, which is the Ponzi business. And he said, Jim, I told him this on a Friday night, expected to be in handcuffs over the weekend because um, a five-minute phone call would have determined there was no investment advisory sub-account. There were indeed no trades that could ever be traced through there. And guess what? The SEC did not make the phone call. It's kind of hard to believe. And that's just one instance. The third example, really inexcusable, was Bernie's bank was J.P. Morgan Chase. They were the only entity that actually could see into Bernie's financials because they saw his bank account there, which was known as the 703 account for the last three digits. And the hedge fund guys, nobody else the, saw this account. The SEC didn't even know the account existed because he didn't report it on his regulatory form. And not only did J.P. Morgan not look inside it and figure it out, because Bernie admitted to me he never had more than $5.9 billion in the account ever. Um, they didn't even know that it was the investment advisory account. They thought it was the market making account, um, which was at a bank in New York for 30 years. So they didn't know what the account was, but here's a simple thing, Brian, another five minute thing. You're running an equity strategy. You've got to have payments to counterparties, right? Because somebody's yeah. trading with you. And B, you've got to have deposits of dividend checks because you own equities. In fact, there should have been $4.4 .4 billion of dividend uh, deposits over 30, 40 years. And not only was there not one dime, there was never one counterparty payment. So you can see before we even get into the details of these examinations, um, how this thing uh, could have been and should have been solved very quickly. Yeah, it's, I mean, as you just rattle these things off, it just seems mind boggling. It, it does. It's scary because it almost seems like common sense. And even the, the very first one that you mentioned, that supposedly his strategy was just tied to equities to, I believe you said the S&P 100. Yep. Um, so yeah, all your, your classic blue chips. It, how do, and, and so his fund, I guess it never technically had a down year, correct? It never had to be what? It never had a down year. <laughs> not only that it never had a down year, I, I'm not sure uh, how many uh, down months. It was very rare. And, and in fact, I mean, that's how it was so easy for Harry Markopoulos to figure it out because, um, you know, 5% correlation when it should be 95 means it's yeah. almost the, uh, the, the opposite of the, uh, of the strategy. And the funny thing was, is that, um, um, you know, the 
I talk to victims and I talk to the sophisticated traders on the, um, in the market making business, I could never find anyone who understood the strategy or who could explain it. And as I said, conceptually, it's, it's pretty simple. The, um, the statements were completely fake and um, very realistic looking because I said the S&P 100 index, but initially he started off with a basket of 15 large cap stocks, which also should have, you know, reflected uh, the, the, you know, the uh, index, the overall, the NISI pretty closely. Um, but these statements would then have a list of tons of um, trades and stocks of all these big, well-known companies. So it, it looked all looked very um, official. But, you know, the fact that nobody really could explain the strategy that was basically very conceptually um, simple is just, uh, you know, it's mind boggling from from the most sophisticated, you know, hedge funds uh, who had strong risk management down to these poor individuals who saw these beautiful looking statements and assumed that everything was perfect. And roughly like at its peak, I mean, how many uh, parties were invested in this fund, which it was just called Madoff Securities, right? The, the fund we're talking about. What was the, the fund called? Yeah, was it just called Madoff Securities? That was the name of the um, Ponzi scheme? It, it, uh, the firm was known as BLMIS, Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities. And okay. uh, that was a mistake he made, by the way, that, that what underlying your question. If he had set up uh, the hedge fund investment advisory business in a separate subsidiary, like most Wall Street firms did, he could have sold that legitimate business for three million bucks and gotten away with it. Um, obviously, since it was part of it, he could never allow due diligence uh, done. But remember, since he's never really admitting that he's running a hedge fund, he didn't like to have any kind of public name on it. And, he did not even, you know, you talk about all these things that's, that are stunning. Here's a guy running, you know, at that time, maybe the biggest or top three hedge fund uh, sizes in the world. He hadn't even registered as an investment advisory at the SEC, which is the ADV form that you have to fill out if you get beyond, beyond a relatively small number of clients. He, he registered in 2006, two years before the uh, thing went down. Unbelievable. And so how many parties were invested in this at, at its peak? Individuals and, and funds? Um, you know, how many people were in this? Oh, the um, on the U.S. side, there were 16,000 um, investors. And uh, most of those were, th were bundled through hedge funds, uh, feeder funds. And um, internationally, uh, another big number, there were 720,000. Uh, all invested basically through banks and feeder funds. Um, and so there were a lot of people wiped out. My university, I went to Tufts undergraduate, lost $20 million with Bernie through a hedge fund of a really corrupt guy, Ezra Merkin. And so maybe that kind of leads into what I was going to get at is that you have all these you know, the, the number sounds huge when you say 16,000, I think, domestic, 720,000 folks overseas, mm -hmm. but a lot of them really are just being represented by funds that they're invested in. But nevertheless, yes. I mean, you've got $65 billion here of real people's money, and no one ever looked at what you were just debunking in five minutes of, you know, just gain after gain and ever said, huh, you know, what's, what's going on? Yeah, you know, um, first off, I mean, when the... When the money's coming into the feeders, exactly as you say, and are bundled up, um, and the feeders have basically abdicated any due diligence uh, investigation. I mean, there's your answer on that side. On the SEC side, how do you have five investigations? Which, you know, a lot of these individual investors said, hey, the SEC's giving this guy the good household uh, seal of approval. So obviously he's trustworthy. He brilliantly exploited the silos at the SEC. Now, what do I mean by that? The examiners who look at the broker dealer side are separate from those that look at the investment advisory side. And a Ponzi scheme is easy to detect in terms of where's the money, where's the assets, who are you trading with, what's your footprint? And the market making guys didn't really ask those questions. They, they traced the trades in the market making business, which were obviously all there. 
and they um, they did not know how to ask the questions um, on the Ponzi seed, seed, which is why they focused on front running because front running they understood. And Bernie didn't register as an investment advisory, so he didn't have to fear those folks ever setting foot in his in his uh, in the lipstick building. In fact, he did register in 2006. They still never investigated him from the investment advisory side uh, in the final two years. Um, the other thing he did was, and this is again, uh, nobody on Wall Street did this. These examiners would come in, most of whom are young guys right out of law school who don't even understand Wall Street. And he'd lock them in a room and they were only allowed to talk to him and his right hand man on the 17th floor who ran the Ponzi scheme operationally. So they never got to talk to anybody else in the firm, really. And he fed them whatever they wanted. They dumped reams of phony reports on them, uh, which, by the way, the SEC never followed up on. And um, so he controlled the uh, relationship 100 percent. He bullied them. He browbeat them, um, basically misrepresented to them. And so they just were stuck looking at front running every time. And um never really got down to the 17th floor. The 19th floor was run like a pristine business. Now, the examiners started to figure out that, you know, Bernie was sometimes not telling them the truth. He, he would change the amount of assets he would admit to managing left and right all the time. And they never really closed the loop on the contradictions. Um, so he basically ran circles around them. His, his right-hand man had a high school education and was dealing with all these law school geniuses out of the SEC, and, and he, he just totally blew them away. And who was the right-hand man that you said was Frank, responsible Frank, for operations? Frank, Frank D. Pascali, whose own lawyer referred to him as Madoff, Sammy the Bull, Gravano, and the chief fraud <laughs> perpetuating office. This guy um, literally... This, this whole crime was programmed, Brian, on obsolete IBM AS 400s that were out of business in 1980s. And he had them programmed by two programming guys um, to do all this fraud. They basically, um, you know, have the accounts and they would say, um, Brian has $50,000 in cash showing on his estate, on his statement. So we're going to buy him two bundles of the when it became this, the S&P uh, S index uh, 100s, we're going to shove those into his account, all, all backdated, all made up completely. And he ran all of that. And I mean, it was meticulous in some ways down to um, they, <laughs> they were backdating trades sometimes 10 years. So they would make sure that the fonts on the printer matched what the statements should look like um, in an era, say, when they only had matrix, uh, dot matrix printers, not inkjet and laser jet. So it was that level. On the other hand, um, it's, if you looked at the trade confirmation, sometimes, you know, here's Bernie saying, I don't take any management fees. I charge commissions. Well, these trade confirms were stuffed in all the statements for the month. So there'd be 50 of them, 100 of them, a huge number. And often the trade con the trade confirm confirm commission box would be empty. There would be no, no charge in it. So um, uh, it, it was both amazingly complex and then some very simple things that could have been detected. And you know what? I talked to the forensic investigators, and both of us could would just would think and say, Bernie went to such unbelievable efforts to criminalize to cover up, to keep this thing alive, it would have been so much easier to run a legitimate hedge fund and earn the, you know, the market average is 9% over 100 years and just do that. And, you know, yeah. the fact that he spent all this effort, um, you know, to keep this thing alive, uh, it's, just, it's just crazy, all because of his ego and demons. It truly is. And if I can borrow a quote here from, from the new book, this was in an email to you, to the author, Jim Campbell, from Bernie Madoff himself, in which he said, Jim, this certainly sounds strange coming from me, but yeah. I was a constant critic of Wall Street. I was a product of the corrupt culture of Wall Street. Now, you, you've spent quite a bit of time talking with Bernie Madoff. Was, I mean, can you ever say that there was kind of like a good bone in his body and he went awry? Or was this just an 
an evil character from day one. You know, um, I, I, I say that it's not a black and white sociopath, uh, financial serial, serial killer, both of which he was. But that legitimate business, he also ran it as a family. Um, they would pay for everybody's honeymoons. They would pay for sudden medical crises. That was all real. Now, of course, at some point it was paid for with other people's money, but um, it was legitimate. And there were folks that stayed there just because he ran it like that. There were other folks, mind boggling enough, on the, who stayed there because they so admired that they didn't screw their customers, like happens a lot on Wall Street. And um, so that stuff was real. On the other hand, the guy did not have real remorse. You just heard him saying he was a product of the corrupt culture on Wall Street. He thought his investors were greedy. These are guys he wiped out now. They were greedy. They were relentless. They were constantly asking him for results. Um, they wouldn't accept anything but more and more gains. Now, even though he faked all this um, and set it up, they, he blamed them. And he always rationalized that it was somebody else. The big four were screwing him and forcing him to do this. And you can go on and on and on. The, the remorse was never quite there. And of course, the most famous thing, the thing that blew the CBS Sunday morning uh, correspondent, Jim Axelrod, was that at the same time that Bernie was writing the seven, eight page, single spaced, exquisite penmanship um, letters, rationalizing his behavior. He sent a one sentence letter to Andrew and his girlfriend saying, I'm so sorry, dad, not even love dad. But that was Bernie trying to apologize to his son. But here he is to a guy he doesn't even know, writing seven page letters. Uh, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, clearly, um, you know, the CBS guy said, well, Jimmy's a monster, isn't he? And the answer is, yeah, he is a monster, but it's just not black and white. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to ask, too. I mean, you got to know him a little bit. What was <laughs> this is funny, but what was Bernie like behind closed doors? Or I'd have to say almost behind closed bars as well. Um, you know, anything that you can show us that maybe we didn't see as all of this unfolded? Um, first off, uh, he's not a Gordon Gecko type Wall Street guy. He's more like your Jewish grandfather. He was he came across as low key um, and nice, and um, in that and it was that kind of charisma, uh, a low key kind of charisma. Um, I would say he was brilliant. I would say he had incredible recall. I mean, he would go through this stuff with me. Um, it was just amazing. Um, you knew, you got to sense that it was like, if I compare this to Nixon in the sense that he was just obsessed with his reputation and getting it back. And, you know, I was, I ran a legitimate business. I didn't get credit for that. Okay, yeah, I do. I did run a Ponzi scheme, yeah, and it was the worst on Wall Street. But why am I not getting credit for breaking down the New York Stock Exchange's monopoly, for lowering the prices of commissions, for you know, for getting uh, legitimizing online brokers, all of which was true. And um, and then of course, Bernie <laughs> had no insight into himself. You know, he would say, Jim Madoff doesn't know why he did this, and I would say, Well, Bernie, aren't you Madoff? And um, he got the SEC didn't know why I did it. And um, but he said his shrink at the prison told him that he had this compartmentalization comparable to what soldiers have in war, which allows them to survive all this brutal killing. He didn't know if it, I mean, he had no relation to whether it was true or not, but he repeated it and said, you know, it must be the way uh, that I am. The other thing is, I would say, is I asked uh, I was going to ask a, a fraud, a finance fraud psychologist, try and dig one out so that I could put that into the book. But by the end, I understood him so well, I only talked to one. And, um, you know, she said that the important thing to understand is that fraudsters always cut corners, even when they don't have to, which is what Bernie was doing. And secondly, that while everybody thinks that the family knew and other people knew and, um, he, you know, he, this had to be known. He said, these guys run these things out of their mind and they don't tell anybody else. It's set up exactly that way. And you know what? Wall Street was the perfect place for him 
because if you know how Wall Street firms are organized, they're very Byzantine in the sense they're very fractured. Um, there's Chinese walls between investment bankers and traders, so you can't find out about insider trading. And so everybody's in their little bucket. They don't know what anybody else is doing necessarily. And that worked perfect for Bernie because no one put the pieces together but Bernie. It's just incredible. It's inc And how did, uh, you know, so this all came crashing down around the time of the Great Recession. Um, in doing all of your research and everything else, what, when was the point that it really did bubble over? Because I can't recall, it just kind of exploded. Yes. But what was that first like tipping yes, point? Yes, and, 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 you're, and you're right. It was, it was the Great Recession because without that, Bernie would still be in business, I'm convinced. And I calculated at his rates of returns, he'd get $240 billion this year. Um, what happened was um, Lehman Brothers uh, went down, uh, then Bear Stearns um, had to be bought by J.P. Morgan. The world looked like it was crashing. There looked like there'd be a global economic collapse. And $7 billion was taken out of Bernie's fund. So he actually knew the exact date that he was going to default on a payment, which was going to blow everything up. Um, and that was around December 21st, a, a hedge fund called Optimal out of Europe. And it was going to be a $250 million payment. And he had this perfectly laid out. It was going to be on a Friday. So they weren't going to notice that it wasn't in their bank account to a Monday. And then he was going to say, well, we're still in the trade. So, uh, so the uh, assets will be, got, will be gotten to you as soon as the trade is complete. And then that would have gotten them through Christmas when banks were closed again. Hmm. But here's what, and in this interim, he was going to confess to his family and he was going to go to his lawyer, Ike Sorkin, and ask how he turned himself in. Because above all else, he did not want to be perp walked out of his firm in front of his sons and in front of everybody. So Bernie, the control freak of all control freaks, was going to control how he went down. Except he panicked. And at the end, he was so almost catatonic with stress. He would be lying on the floor in his office. He'd be staring out the window. At the same time, he was desperately seeking money. I just told you he was going to default on that money uh, to Optimal, the hedge fund. He actually tried in Thanksgiving to get Optimal to put more money in at the same time that he was going to default on what he owed them. So oh up until the day before... He confessed ahead of schedule due to his quasi breakdown. He was still getting money brought into the fund. Um, so what happened was that basically the, the financial crisis um, left. He did not have any gates on his fund like a lot of hedge funds do. He gave people their money the minute they asked for it. And uh, that's what became the problem. And that $7 billion that, that started the whole thing in motion, was that from the big four that you mentioned earlier? Uh, what, what, sorry, to ask that again. So the seven billion that was taken oh, yes. out of the fund, um, was that all the big four, it, the usual? Uh, not all, not all the big four. No, that was um, people. You know that that even you know he had um, a whole bunch of individual investors that he had from the very beginning that um, were totally trustworthy of him, and not high net worth investors like the like those other investors. They were. Um, of moderate means and it put money in periodically over 40 years. It was some of them, it was some of the, the, the feeder funds trying to take money out. And by the way, in the past, um, there were times when Fairfield Greenwich, for instance, the biggest domestic feeder, feeder fund, took a billion bucks out of the fund um, when he had a cash crisis back in uh, either 05 or the 90, uh, uh, 92, uh, 2002 one, sorry. And at that time, the, the big guys, the big four did bail that out. But this was across the board kind of thing. People tried to take uh, uh, money out. It wasn't that the big four forced him to crash. Um, and they were help, They were still trying to help. Uh, remember, they didn't know it was a Ponzi scheme. So they were still trying to help find out ways. He was taking money from them right up into the end uh, as well. Yeah. And, and so was that uh, that one default? Is that... Because I don't recall, is that when he came forward and admitted everything, or how did how did they well, actually say? Yeah, what what happened? What actually it. happened is, um, what was supposed to happen was that you just said was he was going to default, 
And when the, when they finally figured it out, which was in his mind going to be right after Christmas, actually, and this is the, the good side of Bernie that shows up every now and then, he wanted to get his employees, to, he didn't want them to, to destroy their Christmas. But anyway, when he prematurely um, basically collapsed, um, his right-hand man, Dee Pascali, had planned to cover everything up. They were going to destroy whatever they could. And Bernie obviously took that away. So they were screwed there. But how it happened in terms of getting turned in, he, um, when his son saw him um, appear to be having a nervous breakdown in his office, they rushed in and they took him home. And they got him home, which is up on the Upper East Side in a penthouse apartment on East 67th Street. And he um, confessed. And the sons, rather than... Uh, yeah, the, he confessed to the sons and Ruth. And rather than um, moving their money or delaying a few days or helping Bernie cover it up or whatever, they left the apartment instantly. They went to their lawyers to find out how they could turn them into the FBI. And the FBI then showed up at the apartment. Um, well, actually, here, this is kind of funny. Um, their lawyer called the, um, uh, the SEC and said, uh, we've got a report here of a 50, use the number 50, $50 billion um, financial fraud. And um, it, it was a Friday night, Friday. And um, the, the SEC guy said, oh, come in, uh, you know, call us tomorrow about this $50 million fraud. The lawyer said, no, 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 50 billion. And the guy said, oh my God. And uh, they sent the FBI up. Uh, and the FBI actually arrested him the next morning, um, uh, took him downtown and booked him. So remember, he was supposed to have uh, talked to his, his lawyer, Ike Sorkin, um, to figure out how he would turn himself in. Instead, Ike Sorkin is in his granddaughter's classroom in Washington, D.C., sitting in those little mini chairs that they have in the classroom. And Bernie <laughs> calls him and says, um, I'm, I'm handcuffed to a chair in, an F, in the FBI uh, New York City headquarters. And he's going like, my God. And he got on the phone and told the FBI, stop asking questions. He hung up and he still had no idea why Bernie had been arrested. Bernie still hadn't told him. And when, when he got back to New York the next day, Bernie had already confessed to the FBI before he asked his own lawyer uh, what he should do. So um, that's basically how it happened. So ultimately, who went down in this thing? I mean, Bernie Madoff steals all the limelight. You know, it sounds like he had a right-hand man that was just as bad as he was, you know, if not worse in some ways, orchestrating the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Who eventually got locked up and penalized in this whole scheme? Yeah, there is another great question. So on that um, 17th floor that Frank was the chief operation, operating guy or what we call the chief fraud perpetuating officer, there was this relatively small crew, again, all high school graduates, ranging from Annette Bongiorno, who I mentioned earlier, who was his right-hand administrative person. And she handled the big four, by the way, all the backdating. She had, she, he hired these women um, and, and uh, Frank Pascali and two computer guys precisely because they had no idea how Wall Street worked. And they were high school guys and they would do what they want. Now, over time, they obviously had to figure out something wasn't right. They never figured out it was a Ponzi scheme in 40 years. But Annette Bongiorno, as an example, who was his right-hand admin, her last year, she made $670,000 and had a $580,000, uh, sorry, $58 million fake IRA she thought was real. Two floors up, the equivalent job was held by Ele Eleanor Squillary who was the administrative assistant to Madoff in the legitimate business. She was making $125,000 a year, including her bonus, and had no IRA. Okay, what happened to these folks? All of those guys on that floor, uh, the handful, were indicted and tried criminally and um, went to jail. Frank Pascali turned government's evidence against them and uh, he was going to be sentenced after the trial, after he testified, but he died. Um, Bernie went to jail. And guess what? No one else went. None of the hedge fund guys, none of the big four guys. The SEC that grossly screwed up, demoted eight people, lower level, and not one SEC person lost their job. No one on Wall Street went to jail. 
and um, basically no one was held accountable criminally. Jeez. Just Other than that small group. And by the way, yep. Bernie died in April, as you know, two weeks before my book came out. I, he was the last person in prison. So there's nobody in prison now related to this scheme. Wow. And so he, he goes, you know, on, on that day when he has the breakdown and his kids take him home, he makes this confession to them. So the, the, even like that inner sanctum, the family, they didn't really know his own sons. Yeah, you know, um, that's what people find hard to believe. Um, I asked Ruth, in fact, um, what's the first thing that you said after Bernie told you? And she claims that she said, what's a Ponzi scheme? And um, you got to remember that, that the boys ran the upstairs business with no access to downstairs. And they ran it 100% um, legitimate. And Bernie was somebody they idolized. And Ruth was had cult-like devotion. Um, should they have known something was up? Yeah. Should they have um, asked harder questions? Yeah. But Bernie somehow didn't get the hard questions from the SEC, from the feeder funds, from uh, any of his investors. Um, he had this way of manipulating, bullying and controlling. Andrew even wanted to quit to go to work for Goldman Sachs and Bernie basically uh, wouldn't let him. Here's what it comes down to, though. And what what may be more understandable for people. If you know Bernie's ego um, and having to be the go-to guy, you would know that he could never have told his family that he had to turn to a criminal enterprise to keep the business going. And um, that's why um, they didn't know. Now, I always say, you know, it's nice that they didn't know, um, but they benefited from that firm like it was a piggy bank. Ruth was charging over 50000 a month on the corporate credit card. Again, she didn't know that it was being, the, it was being paid off by Ponzi money, but um, and the boys got millions of dollars of loans for buying co-ops and things like that, which Bernie claimed they repaid. But uh, the fact is that, um, that they, they, the firm was pilfered. It was a private firm. And as you know, people tend to do things like put their cars on it. But what they were doing was excessive. So they didn't know it was a Ponzi scheme. They did turn their father in right away. They didn't even, they were even totally upset with Ruth because Ruth initially stayed with Bernie. Um, so they didn't know it was a Ponzi scheme. And I'll add one thing, Brian, that's interesting is um, it's, the, it, it's hard for me to understand this. But if you think about it, Catherine Hooper, um, who's, who, was a source for this book and helped me get inside the firm. She was Andrew's girlfriend. Andrew Madoff, Ruth Madoff, and Bernie Madoff all trusted their legacies with a guy they didn't know from Adam, and none of them saw the book before it came out. And um, I was investigating whether Andrew knew right up into the end, because there was a big question mark that I had a very hard time getting underneath. And I was going after Catherine at the same time and trying to figure out, you know, how I could get an answer on this, to whether as a, as a related to Andy and Mark. And um, so when the book comes out um, and I sent it to Catherine, um, she, I had only told her that the, the book will say they did not know, but I didn't tell her anything else in it. Um, so at, when, at that point, she said, uh, I hope you sell 65 billion, uh, billion books. And you know, obviously, where that number comes from. And then during the CBS Sunday morning interview, she apparently watched it with her father. And she said her father did play by play by everything I said, because they asked me point blank, did Ruth know? And um, so apparently the family then obviously felt good about my findings and indeed I contacted Ruth's lawyer because Ruth was no longer talking to me and Ruth uh I sent Ruth a book which I signed to her so Ruth has the book Catherine has read the book so it's one of the mind-boggling aspects people say well how did they get how did I get them to open up why did they talk to me and essentially why would people trust their legacy with some guy they have no idea what he's going to do other than that i made it clear i was going after the truth 
if I found, and by the way, this is another great tribute to Catherine's character. She told me, Jim, to the depth of my soul, I don't believe Andrew knew, but if you find out he did, I will accept it. Hmm. And have they read the book now? Have you spoken to them since? I, as I said, Catherine has read the book and sent me yeah. a handwritten note, you know, and um, I don't know if uh, uh, Ruth has read it, but she, I know she has the book because her, uh, her lawyer uh, guaranteed that they would put it in her hands. Um, okay. they, they watched the, the fam they watched the CBS Sunday morning news thing too and he said the family was vastly relieved because remember the FBI even up to the end believes that, that the family knew I knew stuff the F FBI didn't know but the FBI uh, believes that the, that the sons knew um, so you know I was sort of going out on a limb but um, uh, you know I was comfortable with it with my finding but again it doesn't excuse the way they piggy bank money out of that firm so it sounds like the, the fbi believes that they knew it, it sounds like you may think that they knew but there's nothing that we can actually show to prove that they did know um what i yes exactly right there's like five million pieces of evidence and no one has ever found that the reason the fbi the fbi told me that they were convinced that bernie was grooming the sons to run the firm okay so obviously therefore they had to know I know that wasn't true. I know it wasn't true through several different ways. Um, obviously, you know, I knew Andrew wanted to quit. I knew the boys knew nothing about it or claimed they knew nothing about it. I knew, and think about this, that firm was taken down by the authorities. Anybody inside that firm that could identify the sons as, as being complicit would have turned them in in a second because they would have gone to jail. And that one person in that firm, by the way, Frank D. Pascali was incredibly angry because Bernie didn't play out the game plan and left him hanging. OK, Frank D. Pascali said that the kids did not know. OK, Ike Sorkin said the kids were so frustrated with the way Bernie was running it. They wanted the name change to Madoff Securities. So there was a succession strategy that broadened the firm behind Bernie. And obviously, Bernie would not allow that. Um, so I am uh, completely comfortable the FBI was wrong in that assumption. And obviously, the Southern District of New York and the SIPC bankruptcy trustee all thought that they were complicit, and n none of them have ever been able to make an arrest. Now, SIPC uh, went after clawback money, um, which was money that was um, ill-gotten gains. Um, and the uh, family, um, Ruth agreed to give $100 million back to the Justice Department, and um, the rest upon her death will go to the trustee and the boys gave back money from their estates after they die and the only reason they didn't up front was that the trustee wanted all their money and um, they felt that they, they'd earned um you know some legitimate money from the regular business so um the authorities are not right that they knew or they don't have any evidence that they put it that way but the family oh, still yeah. living ruth and the sons they uh they haven't been penalized they haven't gone to jail. They've had to give back some of that callback money, I believe you said. But I guess what a lot of people want to know out there is, are they still living the life of luxury? You know, are well, you, you, you got you to remember, uh, Mark committed suicide two years to the day after his father was arrested. And Andy died in 2014 from cancer. And as Andy put it to me, my father killed my brother quickly and he's killing me slowly. Um. So, so both um, sons predeceased Bernie. Yeah, so both his yeah. sons predeceased him. And Ruth, yep. by the way, um, who was worth $800 million at her peak, um, gave away, that all disappeared when the firm went down, but she gave away $100 million to the government, and she was left with an audited $2.5 million, of which 500000 went to lawyers. Um, mm -hmm. So she was not left destitute by any means, uh, but she was living in a, an apartment in Greenwich that cost her $2,900 a month, driving a beat up used car, and every single expenditure over $100 had to be submitted to the CIPIC uh, bankruptcy trustee. Now the boys' estates returned, um, I think the final number was around 16 million after their deaths. And that's because you know um, the fight went on the whole time. Because yeah. the very first phone call I had with Andrew, remember, this is off the record, he doesn't even know me, it's, it's at the point where the entire world believes that they knew. And my first question to him was, 
your dad gave you $2.2 million for a co-op uh, loan months before this thing went down. Why shouldn't, why aren't you giving that back? And he said, you're hundred percent right. I should give it back. And the reason he wasn't at the time was that he was in a, you know, he was under litigation threat and they were trying to negotiate um, uh, what he felt was more fair. But he, I was stunned that he would admit to me with, on the very first question that that was not his money and that it should be returned. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the, that's the tragedy, by the way, is that um, Bernie wiped all these people out, wiped this charity out. Um, his wife had been with him since the age 13 and was cult-like devoted, destroyed that and killed both his sons, for which he admitted that he had a lot of remorse to me and that he, he knew that they couldn't forgive him. He asked for their forgiveness. But here's the thing that also um, people don't know necessarily and which would point to Andy not knowing. I told you he left that apartment immediately to turn him in. He never spoke a single word to his father ever again, ever. I would say, you know, when I met him, you know, a couple of, you know, uh, actually a couple of months, no, a couple of years, sorry, 2011, um, three years. Um, I would say, you know, Andy, talk to him for your own closure, not his. He would, and Andy's response was never, he's dead to me. Wow. And you hear something like that and you almost want to believe what, what your kind of assumption and that they did not know. And you hear something like that, like he never speaks to his father again. How can you not believe it? But I, on the other side of the coin, it's like all those years being so close to this criminal empire. Yep. You know, maybe they're not guilty of knowing, but they are guilty of not asking a question of how the heck is this thing working this way for all these years? It's it's um, it's hard. to It's almost impossible to excuse. Yeah. Yeah. Let me yeah. Let me let me deal with that, because first off, as I said, and as I say in the book, ultimately, there's no excuse that they didn't press. I understand why they didn't, because I understood how he treated the SEC is. I mean, he was telling Fairfield Greenwich. He was scripting their responses to the SEC. Now, these are Wall Street sophisticated risk managers. OK, how the hell is he getting them to script their responses and, and full of lies, by the way? Uh, and here's one. Um, you may not you do not tell the SEC that I'm managing the money. You say that I'm executing your trades. OK. Meanwhile, they had signed documents giving Bernie 100 uh, percent control of the uh, assets. On the Suns now, remember this, nobody knew how big this hedge fund was. The Suns had no idea that it was $65 billion. He never represented that. So they knew that it was successful. They knew that a lot of their friends were clamoring to get into it. They had no idea how big it was. Um, but yes, why didn't they, there's still, there's never going to be an excuse for why you didn't penetrate, why you didn't quit, even the way, even that he was able to manipulate you. And get this, his sons would be humiliated because all their, their friends would come up and they would say, you know, we've heard Bernie's doing, you know, this incredible hedge fund. It's a great deal. Um, it's, uh, you know, you don't lose money or anything. Can you get us in? So the sons who were running the market making business would go to their dad and he would often say, no, I won't accept them. They would have to go back and admit that even though they were running part of the firm, they couldn't get their friends into the into the hedge fund. Now, that was because Bernie was doing them a favor and didn't want them to come blow themselves up. But they didn't know that. And so they were actually humiliated. We talked about Andrew uh, never talked to, to him, talking to him again. Andrew was tough. Mark was not. Mark was a tortured soul. And the day that this went down, Eleanor Scolari, who I mentioned as the... Um, his legitimate secretary was driving home and the, her daughter, Sabrina, called him in the car, uh, called her in the car. This is the very day that Bernie's arrested. And she grew up with the Madoff boys in the sense that they, in, in high school years, they worked as interns in the firm. So she knew them. She told her mother hours after she'd heard of the arrest that Mark was not going to be able to handle this and that he would kill himself. And two years to the exact day of his father's arrest, he killed himself. And that, that just gives me chills every time I heard that story. I hear that. I, I repeat that story. It, 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 it's almost 
I'm like almost speechless as you hear all these details of how this all unfolds. Uh, it's one for the ages. Um, it is one I mean, for the ages. It really is. And one, a couple questions here, two part question that I think will help wrap us up, wrap this up. Okay. What would you say changed uh, in finance and specifically Wall Street after Bernie? And furthermore, what do you think is changing or will change now after your book? You know, I think um, the first thing is the SEC uh, had to realize um, that the silos had to be broken down. They had to bring the right, they had to bring the right expertise to bear on these things. And um, has the, has the SEC changed, which would get to the final part of your uh, question. And the answer from my perspective is that, and, and Harry Markopoulos um, validated the first part. They're very good now at, at handling Ponzi schemes. And Harry feels that 90% of the time and Ponzi schemes start every month that they'll mail you, except, he thinks that if you're offshore, you could get away with another Bernie. Um, the other thing that, um, that I feel is that people think the SEC is a cop on the beat and is there to protect investors. And by the way, their website says we're here to protect investors, but they're not. What they are are folks that come in after the mess has been made and clean it up, which by then is a little bit late if you've been the victim and that's what I think is a cultural change that needs to be, uh, it needs to happen is that they become more of an upfront cop. And if you look at things going on right now, like Robin Hood, which has been sanctioned for abusing its customers with a business model that works against them, or the Archegos hedge fund uh, family office that went down, there are these things out there that again, are, that provide leading signs that they're train wrecks. And it would be, better if the SEC handled these things or moved to in front of the train and, and tried to, um, you know, uh, handle these. Now, Wall Street, um, there were no due diligence standards. So I'm calling for, due, you know, due diligence standards to be legal requirements similar to what FASB does in accounting, because no one was held criminally responsible for the fact that these hedge funds completely ignored doing due diligence. Um, and the bank has improved its, its know your customer. Remember I said they didn't even know it was the market, uh, the hedge fund business and the anti-money laundering business. I have even mentioned that all that money coming from abroad, there was a huge money laundering scheme, dirty money being taken from Russian oligarchs, Eastern European oligarchs, drug lords in Colombia. That money was fed through primarily through a bank in Austria uh, run by uh, Sonia Cohn, who was one of the biggest feeder funds uh, around, that money was funneled into Bernie where it then looked like it was legitimate money. And the never has that money laundering been gone after, just as never has the tax evasion scheme by the big four and the oldest investors gone after. So wow. a lot of stuff, you know, doesn't change on Wall Street. Um, but the book has 30 reform suggestions in there from the big to the to the, to the to the smaller reforms. And um, I do hope that um, the culture, you know, will change and that, um, you know, that investors' interest, you know, one of the things that, that, that Wall Street could help on, the SEC can help on, was that investors need to understand exactly what they're going into. They shouldn't be allowed to enter stuff that they don't understand, right? Or where the where there's a guarantee of return up front, which Bernie used to do. Um, and, you know, as I say, the Hippocratic oath in the medical profession should be applied to the investment profession, which is do no harm first. And the market's gone up 9% a year for 100 years on average, as I told you. And an index fund, which is what um, Warren Buffett recommends, periodically invest into an index fund. Don't trade excessively through Robinhood, which what they call fake trading, which it's not, uh, free trading, which it's not really. Um, invest in that, take the 9%. Bernie was offering 11% at the end. Take the 9% and sleep. Well said, well said. I mean, this is just such a far reaching evil empire that uh, it seems the more you dig, the more you could find here. It's incredible. 
Um, and I know we spent so much here on, on your new book, Made Off Talks, which just sounds like such an entertaining read and uh, a real eye opener. It sounds like a crown jewel for someone in, in your business with your talk show, Forensic Talk. Uh, you can't get bigger than, than Bernie Madoff. But just on, on yourself real quick, I know we spent so much time on the book. Would you mind sharing with our listeners maybe what's next on your agenda? Any, how do you well, follow this one up? Yeah, well, um, uh, if, right now, in fact, um, I had to get an agent with CAA, which is one of these Hollywood agencies, because even before the book came out, four production companies uh, came to us and want to make a documentary out of it. And it turns okay. out that what CAA has done is they've gone directly to Netflix. Normally, the production companies go to Netflix or HBO Max, and then Netflix greenlights it and funds it, and then they go make it. In this case, because this is the only book um, that has done the complete Madoff story, in other words, all that stuff we just talked about on, that failed on the, in the system. Um, and right now, um, Netflix made an offer to make a documentary, and we're going back on a counter offer. So the next step is hopefully to have a documentary made on the book. Myself, myself the, um, the question you asked is a really good one because I don't have the answer yet what I'm going to do next. I mean, I've thought of money. This book ends on, you know, the government missed the money laundering aspect of this story. And should I go look at money laundering, which might get me killed, but um, or not? I don't know yet what I'm going to do next. I'm on the book tour and I want to get the documentary. I'd like to you know, nothing happens until it's signed. So I'd like yeah. to see if we can sign a documentary because Brian, just to give you the perspective, we're trying to sell books by the thousands, right? Which would be really successful. The director mm -hmm. that they had me talk to through Netflix um, said that a hundred million people would view this documentary in the first 28 days. So it makes the book look like trivial pursuit. Yeah, wow. I believe it. That's uh, That's pretty cool. Uh, anything else that you want to make sure you share with our listeners today? No, you know, I, I think people will find it um, a riveting read as well as, you know, unveiling the whole thing. And what I keep saying, and your reaction has been this way too, I think people will be stunned how little they know of the whole story. Because mm -hmm. the perception is it was Bernie. Everybody knows it. We even need more Madoff stuff. Now, he died um, right now, which, of course, raised everybody's interest. And everybody, a lot of people don't care about Bernie anymore, but everybody still wants to know how he pulled it off. And um, this book really is the first look at, at how he did it. It's, it's largely untold. Um, the book is made off talks from McGraw Hill. It's at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, independent bookstores around the country, if you'd like to support those, and Walmart online. And anybody can contact me if they, if they have questions directly. Or if you want me to sign a book plate, I can send to you. But um, um, I think you'll enjoy it. And, you know, I really appreciate, Brian, that you let me talk about it for over an hour, which is really nice. <laughs> Certainly. Well, thank you for coming on the show today, Jim. I think that was a, a great conversation. And I can't tell you how many times I was just sitting back in my chair going, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it truly is unbelievable. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Again, I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. You've just listened to another episode of the Kaderna podcast with our guest, Jim Campbell, and his latest book, Madoff Talks. Go check it out. Let us know what you think, and we will see you next week.
The Caderna podcast is for informational purposes only. Individual situations may vary, and the information should be relied upon only when coordinated with individual professional advice. Guardian and its subsidiaries do not provide tax, legal, social security, student loan, mortgage, or real estate advice. Listeners should contact their own tax, accounting, or legal advisors, or the social security department in this matter. All investments and investment strategies contain risk and may lose value. Brian Caderna is a registered representative and financial advisor of Park Avenue Securities, LLC, PASS, 300 Broad Acres Drive, Suite 175, Bloomfield, New Jersey, 07003. Securities, product services, and advisory services are offered through PASS, a registered broker, dealer, and investment advisor. Nine 773-244-4420. Financial representative, the Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, New York, New York. PASS is an indirect wholly owned subsidiary of Guardian. Caderna Financial Team and International Planning Alliance, LLC, are not affiliates or subsidiaries of PASS or Guardian. Caderna Financial Team is a division of International Planning Alliance, LLC, a general agency of Guardian. PASS is a member of FINRA, SIPC. California Insurance License Number, OK04194. Content of the Caderna Podcast is copyrighted by Brian M. Caderna, all rights reserved. Any redistribution or reproduction of part or all of the content in any form is prohibited without prior permission from the Caderna Podcast. The views and opinions expressed herein may not be those of Guardian Life Insurance Company of America, Guardian, or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. Guardian does not verify and does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of, of the information or opinions presented herein. Any third-party materials referenced cannot be endorsed or verified by Guardian and are used as the opinion of the author. Guardian, its subsidiaries, or affiliates do not provide or issue or advise for mortgages. This material contains the current opinions of the author, but not necessarily those of Guardian or its subsidiaries, and such opinions are subject to change without notice.